Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dan Gorodnik, Chair of the City Planning Commission, Director of the Department of City Planning. Welcome to today's meeting of the City Planning Commission. We are joined today by Commissioners Benjamin, Bozorg, Cerullo, Crowell, Dweck, Kermani, Marin, Osorio, and Rampershad. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we expect uh, a few others to uh, join us in a moment or two. Um, I will note it is a bit of an uncommon week for us at the City Planning Commission uh, in that we have no public hearing scheduled for Wednesday. So today, after our normal review session, we're going to have a special public meeting uh, to vote on several proposals and to save staff resources and uh, all of your time. Uh, we will not meet on Wednesday of this week. More on the projects that will start public review and receive votes shortly. First, though, I wanted to take a moment to focus our attention on the current conversation that is happening in Albany about housing and housing creation. In that vein, I wanted to urge the state legislature to approve Governor Hochul's ambitious housing compact this week, uh, and that includes its mandatory targets for local jurisdictions and fast-track approvals. We need these tools to enable us to achieve New York City's 500,000 unit goal over the next decade. This is critical. There is no way out of our housing crisis without a statewide planning framework for building homes. And when we build more homes, we reduce the enormous burdens that New Yorkers are facing on housing costs, gentrification, homelessness, and we allow us to become a more inclusive and successful city and region. Transit-oriented development around train stations also critically important. It's exactly where we should be developing new housing in order to lower housing costs, to boost our economy, and also to bring ridership back to the MTA. We also desperately need other relief in the, governor, uh, the governor's budget that she is championing to allow more housing creation and to make the city more affordable. This includes extending a tax incentive to support the creation of 32,000 homes that are already in the construction pipeline, many of which would be affordable. Without the incentive, we limit much of the hard work we have already done to get these homes ready for New Yorkers. And we need Albany to lift the 12 FAR cap, which prevents our creating opportunities to deliver affordable housing in some of the highest opportunity areas of the city, the state, and nation. Council Speaker Adrian Adams and I penned an op-ed just last week asking that the cap, which limits the construction of apartment buildings to no more than 12 times the size of the lot that they sit on, be lifted. State legislators should enable New York City's local elected representatives to make zoning decisions and to bring more housing where they believe it is appropriate. The 12 FAR cap is an artificial limit that has long outlived its usefulness. Give us the ability to make our own determinations and we will handle it carefully. Finally, we also need action to, facil to facilitate office to residential conversions. This is a win-win to turn underutilized office space into affordable housing, but to get there, we need to change regulations about which buildings can be converted and also set up a tax incentive to create affordable housing as part of those conversions. So in sum, I hope that we will find a path forward in Albany to approve the governor's pro-equity and pro-housing agenda. Shifting gears, I wanna thank everyone who attended our public information session last week on the City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality and encourage more New Yorkers to join our second public information session tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. For information about how to join us, go to nyc.gov forward slash engage. City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality, a priority of Mayor Adams, seeks to modernize our zoning resolution and help us reduce New York City's reliance on fossil fuels. Also, New Yorkers can get more involved in a once in a generation opportunity to reimagine the Cross Bronx Expressway. This collaborative study, which is being led by city planning, and the state and cities, city departments of transportation looks to create a community vision to minimize the harm that the Cross Bronx has caused to nearby neighborhoods. And we'll kick off with remote and in-person meetings over the next couple of weeks. It starts with a remote meeting on 
Thursday, March 30th at 6 o'clock, followed by an in-person meeting at Bronx River Art Center on Saturday, April 1. Details on all five upcoming events can also be found on nyc.gov forward slash engage. Sticking to the Bronx, Mayor Adams announced a plan to expand the Harlem River Greenway to the borough with seven miles of open space from Randalls Island to Van Cortlandt Park. The Department of City Planning's comprehensive waterfront plan emphasized the importance of equitably expanding waterfront access. And this is a great example of how this administration is linking more New Yorkers with their shorelines. As seen from the fantastic photos of that announcement, our executive director, Edith Su Chen, who is right behind you, was one of the stars of the show as she joined Mayor Adams for a bike ride on the high bridge beforehand. Now, before we move uh, today to today's agenda, um, I wanted to note that we have been joined by uh, Vice Chair Knuckles and Commissioner Gold and Commissioner Goodridge. And I am delighted to be able to say that you will hear from our Brooklyn planners in several weeks' time about our initial planning work for downtown Brooklyn and Fort Greene that we are calling EDS and MEDS. This is an opportunity for city planning and the local community, including the NYCHA residents at Farragut, Ingersoll, and Whitman houses, to help express the city's priorities and guide any future private land use applications in this area going forward. And to be clear, it is not a rezoning. It is a framework developed by the department as a way to send a signal to public and private interests about what is important to us. We look forward to lots of future discussions with community and agency partners about the entire area, and we will share the framework with this commission before long. For today's regular review session agenda, we have opportunities for new homes, new open space, supermarkets, and uh, even more starting uh, public review. Uh, we'll start with a proposed building with 30 homes, around 12 of them income-restricted, ground floor retail in Astoria, just blocks from the Steinway Street Commercial Corridor and the M&R trains. This is 42-18 31st Avenue rezoning. In East Harlem, in Manhattan, at 244 East 106th Street, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development is advancing a new residential building with 32 apartments that will be part of SHARE NYC. This pilot uses a shared housing model in which housing units consist of two or more independently occupied rooms that share a kitchen and a bathroom. It's another way that New York City is thinking outside the box to create new housing for all types of lifestyles. Also in East Harlem at 180 East 125th Street, we have a fresh authorization on the docket, another example of this program's ongoing success in bringing healthy foods to underserved communities. The commission will also hear about a residential building under construction at 262 Fifth Avenue near Madison Square Park that is seeking a special permit to increase the number of parking spaces from five to 23. And in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, the Greenpoint Landing Development is pursuing land use actions to achieve its required waterfront public access area for New Yorkers to enjoy. The open space would include picnic areas, seating, viewing, steps, and a lounge area along the pier and more. Public space is a much needed amenity. We look forward to hearing more about this proposal. There are requests for a couple of authorizations from the commission uh, that we're gonna be talking about today. After our review session, we'll hold our special public meeting to vote on several proposals. Most notable of the new housing projects the commission will vote on today is a 100% affordable development with over 330 homes a new supermarket and community facility at 2560 Boston Road in Allerton, the Bronx. We'll also vote on a three apartment building at 155 18th Street in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and a South Jamaica Queens project at 141-05 109th Avenue, uh, which has around 55 new homes, 15 of them, uh, approximately 15 of them permanently income restricted. Finally, we will vote on the renewal of an office lease for the city's Human Resources Administration at 88 Third Avenue in Borum Hill, Brooklyn. This space is used to administer SNAP and Medicaid benefits, among many others, to New Yorkers in need. It's certainly a packed agenda. I thank you all for the indulgence in a slightly longer than usual uh, opening statement here, but uh, I hope uh, we're getting the week started on the right foot. And with that, Ryan, I'm going to turn to you to get us started on the agenda. 
Certainly. Uh, so this is the review session for the New York City Planning Commission for Monday, March 27th, 2023. The time is 1.12 p.m. and a quorum is present in the hearing room at 120 Broadway. The first item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Queens Community District 1. Our presenter is Teal Daly. I'll note that Commissioner Rampashad is recused on this item. Hi, Teal. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. I'll be presenting 4218 31st Avenue for certification. The private applicant 4218 Development LLC is requesting a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment for three blocks in the Astoria neighborhood of Queens Community District 2. The action, sorry, the applicant is requesting a zoning map amendment to change an R5 district with a C12 overlay to a R6 district, or sorry, R6A district with a C13 overlay and an R5 district. The applicant also requests a zoning text amendment to map an MIH area, and these actions will facilitate a new six story, approximately 38,000 square foot residential building with a commercial ground floor. The project area is located in Eastern Astoria and is highlighted in pink on the aerial map. Steinway is a primary commercial corridor in Astoria and is characterized by retail office and residential uses in buildings that range from two to six stories. And this corridor is shown by the red line on the map, which is located uh, about three blocks to the west of the project area. Commercial uses extend for several blocks beyond Steinway Street to the block ends of 31st Avenue and within the project area. The mid blocks are characterized by two story detached and semi attached townhomes. Larger multifamily pre war apartments also exist in the area and are concentrated along wider streets and block ends. The M and R trains are accessible via 46th Street Station, which is located a quarter mile to the southeast of the project area, as well as the Steinway Station, located approximately a half a mile west, southwest of the project area. The N and W trains are accessible about a mile to the west of the project area at Broadway Station. Three buses are accessible with routes to Roosevelt Island, Maspeth, and Sunnyside. Institutional uses in the area include three schools, and these are comprised of an elementary school, which is located one block to the north of the project area, a middle school located three blocks east, as well as a high school located six blocks to the southeast. Limited open space exists in the area and is comprised of Sean's Playground, which is a playground located three blocks to the west as well as a, a playground and a sports field that are coupled with IS-10 Horace Greeley Middle School and William Cole and Bryant High School, respectively. And this aerial shows the project area, and we're actually facing south. The project area is located on a three-way intersection of 31st Avenue, 43rd Street, and Newtown Road. This is a very wide intersection characterized by one to four story buildings with residential and commercial uses, including restaurants, a gas station, and an auto detailing center. As indicated by yellow on the map, the surrounding area is predominantly residential and commercial uses are shown in red. Commercial uses are clustered along Steinway and Broadway corridors, as well as the block ends of 31st Avenue. Institutional uses are shown in blue and show the locations of the nearby public schools that I already mentioned. The dotted black line shows the project area, which is comprised of blocks 692, 693, and 694, and has a total of approximately 46,500 square feet in area. The development site is located on block 692 and is comprised of approximately 10,800 square feet in area. On the map, this is shown in the dashed red line. The development site is improved with a 4,500 square foot two-story commercial building, a 2,000 square foot two-story residential building, and a 1,600 square foot one-story commercial building. South of the development site, the remainder of block 692 contains several two-story residential townhomes. Block 693 is improved with seven three-story multifamily walk-up buildings and two two-story residential buildings. Block 694 is improved with a gas station and a one-story office building. And I'll walk through several site photos 
and I'll start um, from the west and pan over to the east of the development site. This first photo shows a view of the development site facing west from the intersection of 31st Avenue, 43rd Street, and Newtown Road. This photo shows a view looking down 43rd Street and we're facing southwest and the development site is to the right and block 693 within the project areas to the left in the photo. And this photo shows views of block 693 and 694, which are both in the project area facing southeast from the wide intersection. And this photo shows part of the project area to the right, which is the gas station on block 694. And then to the left on the photo shows one of the pre-war multifamily buildings. In this case, it's four stories tall, and this is not in the project area. And finally, this photo is a view facing north from the project area to show how wide the intersection is and what the character of the intersection is um, from the perspective of the project area. The proposed development has a total, is proposed to have a total of 38,189 total square feet of area. This would include 8,000 square feet of commercial floor area and 30,189 square feet of residential floor area. There would be a total of 33 dwelling units, 10 to 12 of which would be affordable, and the applicant is proposing accessory parking in the cellar. The building would have a four-story base height, or 45 feet, and a 65-foot or six-story maximum height. The building would have 3.53 FAR. This site plan shows the ground floor plan, as I mentioned, there would be 8,000 square feet uh, of residential, residential uses, and there would be entrances to the residential, um, I'm sorry, 8,000 square feet of commercial uses, commercial retail, with entrances on 31st Avenue and 43rd Street. There would also be residential entrances on 31st Avenue and 43rd Street, and there's an existing curb cut that would remain in place on 43rd Street and provide access to parking in the cellar. Looking at the cellar floor plan, the applicant is providing 12 parking spaces and 25 bicycle parking spaces. I would also locate mechanical equipment on this level. This floor plan shows a typical apartment layout for the second through fourth floors. And this floor plan shows a typical layout of the fifth and sixth floors. The applicant is requesting a zoning map amendment in which the R5 district with the C12 overlay would change to an R6A district with a C13 overlay within the first 100 feet of the block end on 31st Avenue. Beyond 100 feet, an R5 district would be mapped, which would more closely align with the established residential character of the mid block. R5 districts allow for one and two family homes with a maximum FAR of 1.25 and a maximum building height of 40 feet. Rear, front, and side yards are required and parking must be provided for 85% of dwelling units. The C12 commercial overlay permits retail and commercial uses up to a one FAR in R5 districts and those of lower density. The R6A district would allow for a multifamily building with a maximum FAR of 3.6 and maximum building height of 85 feet. The base heights in R6A districts must be between 40 and 65 feet. Parking must be provided for 50% of dwelling units or 25% for income restrictive units. C12, or I'm sorry, C13 commercial overlays permit retail and commercial uses up to a two FAR in R6 districts and those of a higher density. The applicant also requests a zoning text amendment to map both MIH options one and two. Option one would require 25% of residential floor area to be um, for affordable housing units for residents with incomes averaging 60% of the area media income and with a minimum of 10% of housing to be affordable at 40% AMI. Option two would require that 30% of residential floor area must be for affordable housing units for residents with incomes averaging 80% of the AMI. So 
In summary, 4211 Development LLC requests a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment to facilitate the development of an approximately 38,000 square foot residential building with ground floor retail. These actions would allow for a moderate increase in density on a wide intersection of three streets and would facilitate the development of 33 dwelling units, 10 to 12 of which would be affordable. Residents would have access to several subway lines as well as commercial corridors. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Teal. Just a couple of quick ones from me. Um, so just confirming that existing curb cut that lives there on 43rd Street, that will be the curb cut that would be used for access to the cellar. Is that correct? Yes, this is correct. Okay. And the parking spaces, um, the 12 parking spaces, um, where does that fall in terms of the minimum uh, requirements or uh, the existing standards that we have for parking? Sure. Yeah, the applicant is providing the minimum required amount of parking and, and no more. Great. Thank you. Let me see what other questions there are. Commissioner Buzzard. Uh Do we know if that pre-war building that's across the street, is that rent stabilized? Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head. It's something we might be able to find out. Okay. I think we should be able to find out. That'd be interesting to know. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Teal. Uh, this item is certified, and uh, we appreciate your presentation very much. Thank you. Thank you. The second item on our agenda is a certification of an acquisition and disposition and referral of a City Planning Commission certification uh, in Manhattan Community District 11. And our presenter is going to be Jose Trucios, but he might have uh, gone upstairs. We'll ting, uh, ping him and we'll go on to the third item. The third item is our, on our agenda is a certification of a special permit in Manhattan. Is that the oh. oh, I'm sorry. I had to put it my... Okay. Oh, yeah. We can go to the second item then. So Jose is going to present on second item. Hello, Jose. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Well, let me get a clicker. Uh, this is Sharon YC, a project in East Harlem Community District 11. HPD, um, the Department of Housing and Preservation and Development, is proposing an acquisition of a vacant portion of the of, a, of the vacant portion of a lot in 1655 Lot 29 in East Harlem Community District 11, and subsequently the disposition of such lot for the disposition and also there is a certification for the CPC and the MTA for a transit easement to see if it's required or not. Um, this will facilitate the development of a 10-story chair housing, supported housing under the chair NYC pilot program, facilitating the development of 32 rooming units with community facilities space for on-site supported social services. Um, the development site located in Community District 11 um, in East Harlem is bounded by Third Avenue to the west, east of uh, 106 to the north, and 105 to the south, and Second Avenue to the east uh, in an R9A. So the portion that you see graded in ye um, yellow with the red dotted line is what will be disposed, or acquired, and then disposed. So it's not the entirety of the lot 29, it's only a portion of that, which is entirely within the East Harlem Corridor uh, in an R9 district and also within the tra Special Transit Land Use District. The other portion, the rented portion, is an R7-2. Uh, no, R7-8, sorry. Our little background on timeline, uh, the Lot 29 was disposed on 1995 through HPD through Ascending Neighborhood Development. Uh, at that time, there were, with that disposition, there were some uh, more requirements and restrictions to the lot to what could be potentially developed in it. So it limited the new development for um, housing of four units or less and only limited to rehabilitation and improvements to existing buildings. Um, it wasn't in two, until 2014 that the neighborhood construction program and the new infill improvement program, I want to say, opportunity program that were developed by HPD that allow more development in smaller 
vacant lots like this. So there were an, an opportunity to develop this portion of the lot at the time in 1995 until now. Um, 2017, city leaders realized that there were uh, opportunities to, you know, be explored in terms of the needs of more small households in the in to meet the commitments of House in New York, about 300,000 housing units by 2026. And in 2018, HPD, you know, released the Chair NYC pilot program to explore existing and potential chair housing opportunities. Uh, in 2019, uh, HPD announced the designation of Ascending Neighborhood Development, which is an uh, East Harlem affordable housing developer with many years in the community, and the California Center, which is a nationwide, um, I don't want to say it wrong, but they advocate for a lot of the work that LGBTQ uh, youth um, in, in the nation, and a lot of their services are pro I know, not to help that particular population and they will be partnering in this development. As I mentioned, so the Chairway C program essentially what is encouraging is the smaller type of housing, the community uh, type of home-like environment. Uh, and the, of the three uh, different development sites that were awarded the Chair NYC well, was one of those, uh, you know, allowing them to create more affordable version of dorm style living arrangements for that uh, for this particular development site. Uh, here's some pictures of the surrounding area, which is you know in the majority uh, residential in the scale between you know four to ten stories. Uh, Second Avenue, their avenue being in the main corridors, which encompasses a little more of the uh, ground floor retail. Here's a view of system conditions within the is 1063, the site, you know, adjacent to the existing uh, building of five stories. And I see anything else. Ground floor retail or so. Views of that uh, also in 106, uh, looking northwest at the, I believe, 20 stories, um, Franklin Plaza, and the rear yard, which is existing right now, but doesn't have access of the the existing building that is on the site doesn't have access to the yard, so has been underutilized for some time. And this is a view of the current development site with a little mural trying to lighten the actual, you know, site. Um, kind of a quick summary of the proposed development. It, again, it's a 10 story chair supported housing residential building uh, with, you know, a total of about 20, 21,000 square foot of total area. Of this, 19,000 will be kind of like residential, you know, uh, under the nonprofit institutions with sleeping accommodations, and about 3,000 for supporting social services, you know, which is, includes some um, multi purpose, multi -purpose ground floor uh, rooms, office spaces, uh, four share housing units, and one superintendent unit, which will generate total 32 rooming units distributed between the third and the 10th floor. All right, so um, just a, a quick kind of like look, and I have a little more floor plans later on about um, the chair housing unit style. Um, there are five chair housing units and one superintendent unit, and these are distributed in, you know, about is two per floor, right? Having like four units, four rooming units per floor, so in the total 32. Floor plans of the cellar, ground level, and second level. And here you can say we have about like four unit, or four rooming units or bedrooms per floor on a typical uh, unit plan. Just coming back up a little bit to see the actual uh, in the ground level where the amenities for the uh, for the building will be located. The multi-purpose in the back, the outdoor space. Uh, there's a lobby and also a, uh, what, is, what is called a working, I want to say working study, or where is it? Okay. All right. Uh, the site is also located in the, within the um, flood zone, so the ground floor level will be raised by three feet of the design, the design flood elevation. This site was also analyzed within the environmental impact statement of the e Harlan in 2017. And in, 20, in March of 2022, 
HPD uh, issue a technical memorandum ensuring that there were additional uh, adverse impacts identified as part of this project. In summary, uh, HPD is acquiring the site, uh, the, the vacant portion of the site, redisposing and conveying it to ascending in order to allow for the development of housing, given the restrictions in 1995 when allowed it to, you know, create more affordable housing of that. It's also, you know, important to say that the East Harlem rezoning in 2017 get more potential development for this site. So the site will be developed under the quality housing and the mandatory inclusionary housing um, regulations. The site could potentially go up to uh, 8.5 FAR or a high of 175, but given that it's limited by the uh, the, uh, the high of, I had it in my notes, but I can access this right now, but I can't remember what it's called, but it's a restriction on the section that allows how high you can go with a smaller size. So this only has a 27 feet of frontage. So it's restricted about how high you can go. So it's only limited to 100 feet. Maximum. The, the sliver lot rule. Sliver. Yeah, the sliver lot, lot rule. So the, yeah, I was going to say the, the section the, when the um, when the lot is particularly narrow, less than forty feet, and then yeah. limited in height. Right. So it's limited to a hundred feet on this case, which gives you a C point five FAR, which is still a lot more from you know given the East Harlem uh, particular. Uh, MIH requirements. There will be also the open space or rehabilitating rear yard that will be only accessible to the residents of the new building. Unfortunately, like I said, the existing uh, building on the site doesn't have access to the backyard, so there is no way to ensure that they have access to the new improved site. But there is an easement agreement between the existing and the new proposed building to allow the new residents to use that space. Um, in 2013, oh, in 2013, the, uh, the MTA issue a transit easement and not require uh, for the for the easement volume in here. Um, we reached out to them back in 20, in December 2022. They, you know, reconfirmed that they won't be requiring an easement on this site as well. And the site will be developed in, in under Enterprise Green Community Standard Building. This is something that is uh, very, uh, you know, present in most of the developments in the Send then neighborhood development up in East Harlem. They have a very strong relationship with the community board. And, you know, this being certified today doesn't mean that the community board has already been looped on this for I believe two, three times. And they have worked with them into what this has become since I first saw in three years ago. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Jose. Um, let me go to questions from commissioners. Uh, but uh, before I do, a couple of quick points of clarification for me. Um, the history of this site is pretty complicated. Um, based on your presentation, it's clear that HPD back in 1995 mm -hmm. disposed of this property to ascendant neighborhood mm -hmm. development, which as I understand it, then did a rehabilitation of the building, one, the building that existed and still exists there on the site but did not do anything for the adjoining site next door. Mm -hmm. Correct so far? Yeah. Okay. And the action here that we're looking at is an acquisition and a disposition, mm -hmm. acquisition from uh, the same party, which is uh, uh, Ascendant Neighborhood Development, and a disposition to Ascendant plus uh, Ali Forney. It will be back to ascending only. Uh, um, Ali is part of the program. Management, yeah, the program of the building. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just ex just ex take another minute, if you don't mind, explaining to us why we are reacquiring mm -hmm. and redisposing of the side lot, which was never developed. I may have stolen Commissioner Gold's question. I can see from his face, but we're gonna. But if he still has one, he's gonna be the first in line. Sorry yeah. about that. Go ahead. No, no, um, sorry, Fine. And actually, I was able to reach out to the, the applicant <coughs> early on, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look specifically for that email. But to my understanding, and, and HPD is also aware of this issue, and they will be able to answer these questions in, you know, a more uh, straightforward manner. But to my understanding, it, it was that the 1995, you know, accelerated user to city council had a specific restrictions in terms of what they could do with the development 
uh, the, the, the actual lot. And that kind of like they're restricted of how much in, of, you know, housing units they could produce. I want to say that the, you know, the 1995 was only for improvement and, you know, and rehab of the existing side of the four units in there. I don't think they developed the four, you know, that, that story. I think it was just only rehab, limited to rehab on that side. Uh, and, you know, this new acquisition will release those restrictions and particularly allowing them to do more of this, you know, developing more housing units in general than it would normally do through it and, you know, other programs in HPD. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Gold is going to defer for a moment to Commissioner Benjamin, who uh, I believe may have some specific personal knowledge on this. Right. I, in fact, did this item. This was an accelerated UDAP, and the accelerated UDAP program is only available for land uses that are one to four units or rehab. And when that occurs, it does not come through the planning commission, the community board, or the borough president. The only actor is the council and the land use powers of the council. Um, at that time, this building was presented as a rehab, and there were, as I recall, there was going to be open space on the rest of the lot. So, Got it. Thank you, Commissioner. No, no I'm good. That was okay. it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gold. Uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, Jose, I'm uh, looking at the layouts of, of these proposed units. Uh, so is the targeted uh, occupancy here families or individuals, or who are I, we targeting? We're, Formerly uh, homeless, I know, but among that demographic. Yeah, so I, I believe it's going to be specifically to um, targeted to young adults, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, residents in the area, given the pro program that is, you know, supporting the, the development here. You said young adults. Mm -hmm. So, are these would these be individuals who are aging out of the the, the foster care? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. How close to mass transit is this? The closest um, station is at an East One Ten Street. So it's within walking distance. You you have that one. You have the Ninth of Street, I believe, as well. So it's not too far, and, and it's also part of the expanded Second Avenue, okay. um, you know, plans for the MTA. Mr. Marine. <clears throat> sure, thank you, Chair. I'll say it. I'll say it. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation. You know, it's it's nice to see this to come to fruition. I know that we have been presented. This body has been presented with some studies. I believe they were specifically in Spain, where they have more family type oriented units, but a central core where it had kitchen, ironing space, community space, TV room. So that concept is interesting here. Um, and I do understand that now based on the question answered to Commissioner Knuckles really, re regarding the demographics that they're young adults and seeing the layouts, these look, you know, more like roommate type situations. So okay. who's, my concern would be, you know, how are they being vetted once placed who's supervising, what type of programs are in the building to support them, and then, of course, have there been any studies in the community to support this type of development um, positively, um, either community board or, or not-for-profits that are involved with this endeavor? Yeah. That's a, a great question. I don't want to, you know, um, speak on behalf of the actual developer and their programming. I know that, you know, their on-site community service will include uh, some type of, like, you know, work Force development programs or so. I know that they're, you know, oriented towards that young adults and, and homeless services providing within the area. But I think they will be more equipped to answer those particular questions. It does include, I um, mean, if we can go back to, you know, perhaps one of the floor plans in here. Um, so like, it does include, you know, like uh, there are five shared kitchen units. Um, there is the 18 total ADA accessible bathrooms. Uh, in, Two per uh, per floor, but yeah, that, those were one of the concerns that we had early on in terms of like Harlan or East Harlan in general. My community board being part of, you know, wanting to have more family oriented type of housing, you know, like two, three plus bedroom. Uh, but we also recognize, and as when I say so we I'm talking about like members of the community board being in that, um, you know, in those meetings, as part of like this type of housing is also needed. 
right? So it's, it's in a, a lot smaller site that would not generate the amount of housing, particularly that will be perhaps appealing for, you know, families. And, and so, like, potentially you could generate under the, you know, neighborhood construction program or the HPD program that is not targeted for church housing, you will generate a little less than the amount of rooming units that they will generate under this program. So the applicant has considered those uh, in terms of, you know, what will generate the, the more um, uh, number of units, and they feel like sharing with you is the appropriate one. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. prep the sponsor, though, to, yeah. to come in with some details. Yeah. No, no, that I would think be it's very really, I mean, This is really yeah, very interesting. I mean, that's about this program. And yeah. so get, gleaning more information would be great. And then my last question would be, I will assume that the units are coming furnished. Yes, they come furnished, and I believe also all utilities are paid. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Crowell? Yeah, I'm, I am familiar with Valley Forney Center, and I'm just on their website just to confirm some of my understanding of the, the scope of their programs. When, when they do come in, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the precise population that's going to be in different parts of the building because there are a lot of youth in their in their shelter program. I'm not sure that this is this is a shelter per se. It looks like it might be. A, it's a different different kind of structure, but it'd be very helpful to understand the population, their precise ages, scope of programming, and yeah, yeah. I think yeah, that's definitely fair, and I will communicate that to the applicant. Okay. Commissioner Benjamin. Yeah, um, I just had a question about the actual disposition. Is the is HPD acquiring part of the lot that's going to be built on, or are they reacquiring the entire lot? Only the vacant portion of the lot. So, like the the the, uh, the one that wasn't developed. Yeah. Are they going to split the lots then? No. How is that going to? We, we are proceeding under the, the assumption that it's only, we're calling the development site and the project <laughs> area being the, the larger site, so the entire lot 29, but they're not splitting the lot because it's under the same uh, ownership currently, lot 29. So if there were two different owner, owners, would it, they will have to get a authorization and split the lot or, or some type of other mechanism, but since it's the same owner, they are only disposing of what is vacant and conveying it back to the same owner. Right, but I, I guess my concern would be if they're only disposing of part of the lot and it's remaining one lot, if there is a problem of any type, both, lot, both portions will be responsible for anything that occurs on either part of the lot. Mm. That it's the same owner, right? Yeah, it is the same owner. Yeah. Right, but I'm sure that yeah, but, for insurance purposes and other things, there might be a need to separate. For construction and things right. like that. Yeah, okay, that's a... And, and that can, has come... Yeah. We can ask HPD how they right. deal with this. And that question, that you know, be, that has come yeah. up, and that was part of the whole, you know, access from the existing building through the new building back back to the open space, and that's why they, they don't have that access. Kind of like to mitigate the, you know, in and out ingress of, you know, residents from the other, the other building, the existing building to the new building, but more clarification to come with HPD. Thank you. Commissioner Bozar. Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say how excited I am to see this come forward. One of the, the main spirits of a the shared housing RFEI was an acknowledgement that we need different types of housing typologies to meet the different types of demand that this affordability crisis has presented. So just really want to commend um, DCP and HPD for figuring out the complexity of this and Ascendant and Nally Forney for, for kind of being the leader in this space and, and taking us to this next era. It's, it's just really exciting to see it come forward. And I'm excited to see other projects um, that kind of proposed, proposed co-housing come through as well, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Jose. Uh, this item is certified. Uh, we will move on to uh, item number three on our agenda today. Certainly. Uh, so this item number three is a certification of a special permit in Manhattan Community District 5. Our presenter is Connor Clark. Hello, Connor. Hi, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, this is a private application by 5.262 Project LLC, which seeks a parking special permit pursuant to Section 
13451 of the zoning resolution to build a residential accessory automated parking garage with a total capacity of 23 spaces as part of a residential development in Manhattan Community District 5 on West 29th Street between 5th Avenue and Broadway. Under the Manhattan Core regulations, accessory residential parking is capped at 20% of residential units in community districts 1 through 6 and 35% in community districts 7 and 8. The development site outlined here in red is located on the northeast corner of 5th Avenue and West 29th Street. The garage would be located on the ground floor, cellar, and subcellar levels of a 26-unit, 56-story residential building that is currently under construction. Under the Manhattan Core regulations, the building would be allowed five spaces as of right. The development site outlined here in neon green is located in the Nomad neighborhood of East Chelsea. Madison Square Park is located three blocks to the south, and the Koreatown and, Koreatown and the Empire State Building are located a short distance to the north. Marble Collegiate Church is located across uh, the West 29th Street to the north. A uh, protected bike lane runs along the south side of West 29th Street past the entrance to the garage. The area is well served by public transit with the 28th Street station for the R&W trains on West 29th Street and Broadway and the 28th Street station for the 6th train located on East 28th Street and Park Avenue South. The M1, M2, M3, and M55 buses run south on 5th Avenue and the M7 and M55 bus buses run north on 6th Avenue. The M23 bus, uh, select bus service runs east-west on 23rd Street. The development site falls mostly within a C-52 zoning district with a small sliver on the west side of the zoning lot located in the adjacent M16 district. A C-52, C-52 zoning districts are essential commercial districts with buildings that typically contain ground floor retail uses and office or residential uses on the upper floors. M16 districts are light manufacturing districts often located adjacent to residential commercial districts and permit industrial uses that meet high performance standards as well as most commercial uses. The area is characterized by a mix of uses and building forms, including low density commercial structures, high rise hotels, high rise residential, former store, store and loft buildings, converted to residences and modern office structures. These photos taken during the winter show recent progress on the building. The photo on the right shows Marble Collegiate Church located across West 29th Street from the development site. This drawing shows the ground floor, uh, the ground level, the ground level plan of the of the proposed garage at West 29th Street, with the garage entrance outlined in red, and the building uh, lobby located to the east below the garage entrance on the drawing. Cars would drive west on West 29th Street and turn left over the 12-foot wide curb cut into the garage driveway. Two flashing LED warning lights located on either on the exterior wall of either side of the garage door, together with an audible warning, would alert pede uh, pedestrians to the imminent entry or exit of a vehicle. Cars would then proceed to the automated garage door outlined in red on this drawing. The driveway located to the right of the door would be an unenclosed split space. The entry bay to the left of the door would be fully enclosed. In the event that the automated system were processing another vehicle, the garage door would remain closed until the system is ready to handle the incoming vehicle. If the system were retrieving a parked vehicle for a driver seeking to leave, the process would be suspended in order to prior prioritize the incoming vehicle. Once the system is free, the driver would open the garage door using a remote control. The vehicle would enter the entry bay and the driver would position it on the vehicle elevator. The driver and passengers would unload the vehicle and exit the entry bay through the door at the bottom of the drawing. Once the driver initiates the automated parking system using a touch screen in the building lobby, the system would then scan the entry bay to ensure no one is still there and close the entry bay door and the vehicle elevator would lower the, the vehicle uh, to be parked on the levels below. Fifteen parking spaces would be located in the cellar, four in subcellar one, and four in subcellar two. The vehicle elevator would lower cars to each of these levels, and automated guided vehicles, or AGVs, would move the cars around on pallets to place them in available spots. AGVs are free-roaming, <laughs> battery-operated, omnidirectional units that travel on enclosed flat surfaces and communicate via a master traffic control system used to manage the 
automated garage and uh, automated storage and retrieval of uh, parked vehicles. To retrieve a vehicle, the driver would use the touch screen in the lobby to initiate the parking system, which would transport the vehicle up to the entry bay. The driver and, and passengers would uh, board and use a remote control device to open the door and drive out the entry bay. Uh, after stopping at the stop sign, um, mm -hmm. After stopping at the stop mm -hmm. sign and proceeding over the speed bump, uh, they would turn left onto West 29th Street and proceed west. On the subseller one level, there would be an additional loading and unloading room that would be accessed by residents who need additional time to load or unload. Residents would not be allowed to board in the, in, in the vehicle in this area. It would be strictly for loading and unloading luggage. Residents would request their vehicles from the touchscreen or by mobile app and the AVG, AGVs would uh, retrieve them and place them in this spot. The automated barriers of the three sides of the um, on three sides of the vehicle would uh, be raised and allow for loading and unloading. Once complete, the barriers would be lowered, the vehicles would be scanned to ensure no one is inside, and the vehicle would be transported either to a parking space or to ground level for passengers to board. The findings for Section 13451 indicate that the CPC may approve a parking facility that exceeds the 20% maximum limit for Community District 5 if the number of off-street parking spaces in such proposed parking facility is reasonable and not excessive in relation to recent trends in close proximity to the proposed facility with regard to dwelling units and parking spaces. The special permit also, uh, also has findings in Section 13.45 related to congestion, the efficient functioning of streets, conflicts between different modes of transportation, and the character of the streetscape. For the finding related to residential growth, uh, in order to show that the increase in parking is reasonable and not excessive, the applicant completed a residential growth parking study for both developments. The study compared all changes in residential off-street parking, depicted on the map on the, on the left, to all changes in residential dwelling units, depicted on the map on the right, within a 10-year look-back period from 2012 to 2024 extended two years uh, to the anticipated completion of the uh, year of the project. Sites were considered if they were located within a radius of a third of a mile of the development site. The study found that during the look back period, there was a net decrease of 67 parking spaces, including the project and an increase of 2,762 dwelling units. This gives the proposed uh, project a residential growth parking ratio of negative 2.4%. In Community District 5, the maximum permitted growth of off-street parking spaces to dwelling units in a 10-year look-back period is 20%. The applicant seeks a, part, a special permit pursuant to Section 13451 to allow for 23 parking spaces in a garage accessory to a building with 26 units. This would be an increase of 18 spaces over the five as of right spaces allowed in this area of the Manhattan core. Happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. So. Putting aside for a moment the 56-story uh, building with 26 units in it, uh, which is really not perhaps the point of this specific conversation, although that is a sh shocking, <laughs> shocking, uh, yeah. Well, okay, so maybe it is. So, okay, let's talk about the, the findings necessary here just so that we can consider um, this uh, to the best uh, that we can. Um, the findings in the special permit 13-45 uh, includes a, a, a variety of elements, including that the location will not unduly maybe, interrupt the flow. Maybe we can get it back on the screen. Let's do it. Have them in the appendix. Yeah, let's get the presentation back up. Sorry. That's okay. And while you do that, just let's recap that there are five as of right spaces and the request is for 23, correct? Yes. Okay. And it's all automated. Um, and there will be a curb cut regardless because of the five. Correct. Okay. Um, now, in terms of the finding number two, um, there um, is a requirement that the location will not interfere with the efficient functioning of streets, including any lanes designated for specific types of users or vehicles due to entering or leaving movement of vehicles. Just tell us a little bit more about um, what that might include and whether there's anything for us specifically to consider here. Sure, uh, so there, the city designates road space for all types of vehicles, different users. Um, there are bus lanes, bike lanes, um, repurposing of the curb now. 
Um, and the reason why this could be an issue is that there is a protected bike lane mapped on 29th Street running uh, east-west. It's next to the curb, and it runs right past the entrance to the garage. Um, so that would be um, uh, a particular type of user that, you know, there could be a conflict there. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, let me go to questions. Commissioner Dweck. Has the automated system been put in use in another building? Has it been tested? Yeah, there there are some locations around the city where um, these have been installed. The, the, um, same, as, the same system? Do we know if it's the, the same? The same exact system with, like, the same company? That, same company, same operator. Uh, I, I need to get back to you on that. And as far as the, the bike lane interference, I mean, I would say that you already have the uh, curb cut there and the ability for other vehicles to exit. I don't know how much that changes the dynamic. Yeah, as of right, they 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 can do five spaces. So, thank you, Commissioner mm -hmm. Commissioner Gold. So, so just um, one quick question. So, these are all for use by the the residential folks inside the building. Correct. It's okay. accessory. Got it. Perfect. Thanks, Commissioner Rampershad. Commissioner Sorry about. Just a question: Has was there any thought about putting two elevators in? It's rare that you see one. I'm just curious. The 23 cars, God forbid, something should happen, breaks, and they're stuck. I'm just curious if it was any thought. What was the thought process? Uh, I that? I can't speak to the thought process of of the applicant and the architects, but um, I can say that um, the space is is fairly limited. Go back to the drawings. Um, like you see, the it outlined in red, and you know, there's just not not a great deal of space to put in another elevator. Um, but I can I can talk to the applicant. Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Connor, for the presentation. I had three quick questions. One is, building on Commissioner Dweck's, uh, it would be great to know if uh, if this has been used in other places. Uh, what do we know about sort of the uh, energy requirements, energy efficiency of this, and to what extent this actually, how does this relate to the city's uh, decarbonization initiative? Uh, I'm interested in hearing what are the requirements associated with these systems. The second is, um, I'm wondering if you know how much is a parking spot in this area of Manhattan? How much does that cost? Um, do you know? Uh um, so on the energy requirements, I don't I don't know exactly, but I do know that um, the, the department generally um, uh, likes uh, automated parking facilities because they do reduce idling and they have less uh, energy requirements than than non automated facilities. Um, so that's why we have uh, a, a floor area certification for for automated parking facilities in Manhattan Core. Um, uh, as far as but I can I can look further into the the exact energy requirements. Um, if particularly also if if um, these have been used or should be used in connection with any type of renewable energy sources on site or anything that we can uh, sorry any type of what renewable energy sources oh. just to help us think about the, these systems in place. Sure. Yeah. And um, on your second question as to how much a parking spot in this area costs, I can't speak to that. I can say that. We have the example of the previous application that came before the commission, where um, is going for about half a million dollars in, in a particular a particular accessory automated parking facility. Um, but I don't know how much that speaks to the to the general area. And lastly, do we know what the plan is for these parking spots? Are they going to be for the residents, or what do we know about that? Yeah, as far as I know, they're going to be for the residents, but I can get back to the applicant and just see like what the um, what the plan is for distributing those, because I know that sometimes they go to non-residents. But at the same time, uh, just from experience looking at these, the the process of accessing this for a non-resident is can be complicated, especially because there's entrance through the lobby, there's a touch screen, you have to have your car registered with the system and all that. So. But I'll get back to the applicant on that. Thank you, Connor. And sorry, one last question, if you don't mind. This is more, I think I know the answer, but I just wanted to confirm that. Is there any any initiative or any plan to update the uh, parking study for the Manhattan core at this point? Anything that can help us sort of like analyze this proposal? 
in uh, the well, light of everything that we've discussed? Well, we're we're looking into um, parking requirements broadly as a as a part of the housing plan, the housing text amendment. Um, so we'll definitely be visiting, um, you know, the parking requirements uh, in the five boroughs. Um, as far as uh, the Manhattan core, um, we've looked at a few options. We haven't, um, you know, gotten any specific results or recommendations, but um, we can keep continue looking into it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Dweck. Uh, Thank you. I think uh, Commissioner Osario touched on my uh, one of my questions was going to be: um, Do we know if if uh, the space, the parking space, is equipped uh, is wired for electric vehicles? Um, that was one co uh, question and a comment. Th there has been a tremendous amount of residential growth and conversions in that area, and, and not uh, an abundance of parking. I used to uh, work there for about 15 years, and we're a couple blocks away, so I know the area pretty well. And many of the buildings that were former office buildings are been torn down and built into uh, residential property. So uh, there, there is a need for, for residential parking in, in that area for people. But then most of the time, I'd imagine that the cars come out on the weekends and not during the week, so it's not such an impediment to uh, daily traffic. Yeah, that, that usually is the vision for, for these types of facilities. Um, as far as EV charging, um, all spaces will be EV ready. Um, 11 will be equipped with charging stations, um, uh, but that's that's also in flux. They might install more charging stations. And so uh, because of the automated uh, system, how, how does one go and plug in their car? Or is a, a That was exactly my question. Um, so they, when, you, when a driver drives into the entry bay, uh, there's a pallet there, and they plug their vehicle into the pallet, and then the pallet takes it down the elevator, AGV takes the pallet around, and then if the, the driver will um, <clears throat> specify on the touch screen um, whether they want it to be charged, and if they do, the pallet will take it to a charging station. So that'll um, bring you back to my original question, which is to see if this technology has been tested in another, this exact technology has been tested sure. in another location so we can get an idea of how it works and if any malfunctions or, thank you. I'll look into that. And also, there is some sort of a mechanism to make sure that the person has left the pallet before it disappears into uh, the basement of the building, correct? Yeah, that the, the, the entry bay is scanned um, for any movement uh, probably twice. Um, there's, there's a lot of safety protocols for these. Go ahead. Do they scan in the cars and for children, just, um, just in case somebody's left in the baby seat or something? Yeah, they There's do. Assistance yeah. to do that. Children, animals. Yeah. Children, animals, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Rampershad, Commissioner Benjamin. Sorry, just a clarification. Yeah. With, even with these automated systems, are they allowed to reduce the size of the parking space? Because in the zone, isn't it eight foot six by eighteen? But you can also reduce it certain side yard conditions. But in this automated, according to the stuff we have in our, our packet here. They have seven foot eight by seventeen seven. Is that something that the department is, I guess, due to the, the size of the space, they're allowing it to be reduced? Uh, well, the, I can look further into the dimensions. I don't have the information offhand, but there are um, smaller dimensions for automated facilities versus attend versus um, unattended Attended. facilities. Okay. Um, just because if a computer is doing it, then then it's, you know limits the, the amount of movement that's necessary. Okay. I'd be interested in seeing sure. that. Thank you. Commissioner Benjamin. Yeah, I was wondering, um, the fire department has had issues in the past with these automated garages. Have those issues been totally fleshed out and handled, or is it a case-by-case? Case? I'm just, given their location in the basement of a building, I think it's important in the fires that we've had with other kinds of vehicles that um, the fire department really be aware and signing off on these. I mean, I know they have to sign off after us, but I'd like to know the fire department's opinion on how these work and the safety measures that are being incorporated. Yeah, that, that's a fair question. Um, the previous one that you saw um, was um, on 28th Street, and uh, that application was actually held up because um, the fire department had some issues with the layout, 
and they had to sort of reconfigure it, and they ended up with less spaces because of it, although that application was, was turned down by the council. Um, so, so there is, you know, the fire department has been involved in consultations with these. Um, but, uh, yeah, again, I can, I can look in, into okay, that further. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bozorok. Um, I have a question that kind of relates to something, um, Commissioner Duek and Commissioner Osorio has raised, but, um, it's, none of this analysis takes into account the existing parking garages in the area. Is that right? It's just residential growth and parking spaces as, as it relates to residential developments. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the change. It's the amount of the change, change that's happened. But yeah. as associated with residential developments, not yeah. necessarily. Yeah. There's a formula parking for the, garages or parking. Yeah. There's a yeah. formula for determining uh, the amount of parking in a particular garage that's, that qualifies as residential. Oh, okay. So it does take into consideration garage spaces that are for residential use in the area. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Commissioner, are you making the distinction between a freestanding garage and one that is associated with the residential yes. building? Yeah. So when Please. you have a freestanding garage that is an existing freestanding garage and somebody does the analysis as they did here to determine what happened within a third of a mile. Just to be clear, are, are, is that, garages are they included? Analysis. Are the freestanding garages included in the tally? I think the, the, the number there's an, uh, an amount of a percentage of spaces. I don't have it offhand, but there's a percentage of spaces that are considered residential in, in those freestanding garages. Yeah, in yeah. a particular um, that they would allow for like monthly rates or yeah, residential rates. Yeah. It's along those lines, but okay. but it's it's based on community district. I can get back to you. Okay. With yeah, I mean the the general fear trying to better understand what actually is the available parking outside of this ratio or kind of what, and what a little more nuance of what goes into this ratio to understand, are there alternatives that just, that are in the area that aren't being captured here? Um, yeah. Commissioner Benjamin. Okay, Commissioner one Dwight. quick question. Um, I'm assuming these numbers are based on the consumer affairs allowable number of parking spaces and not the actual number of cars that may be in the facility at any time. Uh, yeah, they're they're going to be based on that data. Yeah, uh, they're based on. Yeah. And do you have an idea in this area? I mean, most commercial garages and accessory garages have more cars inside than their consumer affairs permit would allow. Do we have any idea of what that? relationship might be just that's that's a very good question um it would definitely involve a good amount of field work to go out to specific garages to find out i mean it's a good bet that um the operators are are storing vehicles you know in the access zone and on ramps and stuff but um but we really don't have any way of knowing until we you know go out to specific garages and look okay so we can we can get a sense, but I, we're, we're not going to get you know much of an exact number unless we kind of devote a lot of resources to it. So. Although since you are doing, you've talked about the parking work that the department is doing, I would appreciate it if the if in that work they looked at that question of the permanent amounts versus the actual parking that's taking place. Right. Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. Um, one more question. Just uh, based off Commission Benjamin's question, are we assuming that this parking garage will have to be licensed by Consumer Affairs, being that it's not open to the public and it's uh, only open to the residents through an automated system? No, I, I think her, her question is just based on like what data we're using, um, because uh, for the parking study that the applicant is using uh, DCA data, or excuse me, um, DCWP data. Uh, but this this facility, um, assuming it stays just a residential accessory facility, um, would probably not have a DCWP license. Um, it, it's only when garages go public that they need to get a license, mm -hmm. um, and and that's really that's really ends up being up to the up to the operator um, as to whether they make that decision. Uh, who, which agency would be in charge of inspecting the? Um, it would be DOB just to. Sorry, just to, you know uh, the uh, uh, the inspections, uh, annual inspections, or whatever it might be, to make sure the facility is working. Would it be DOB? Would it be fire? Who would be? In oh, yeah, it would be DOB, I believe. Yeah. 
Got it. Okay. And, and fire. And fire. The CFO will have the the maximum amount of vehicles that could be parked in the garage. The buildings would have the enforcement. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Buildings would have enforcement, or it, and would would it be subject to an annual inspection or some kind of inspection or whatever? Yeah, I believe I, I can we have a regime it. for inspecting parking garages at the DOB. Mr. Yeah, I Mr. Just, I just want to just kind of weigh in on thoughts here. The the it's it will be nearly impossible to find out the what's really happening because no one will admit to you that they can only park 100 cars there, but they park 150 cars there every day. Like, it, 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 this, this part of this is about <laughs> revealing the truth versus what the approvals or authorizations actually are. So it, it'll be a very difficult data point mm -hmm. to get because what we're really trying to figure out is how people are really operating, which is never going to be something they admit if they are not operating exactly how the approvals were granted. So that's going to be a that will be a very difficult number to to be able unless you go in there and you one day you count, but it'll be one day. You you don't know that that happens every day, um, but we do know that that's why you have reservoir spaces. That's why you have people are coming and going all the time and. They do tend to fill up a little bit more than they should, um, but I just wanted to say it'll be really difficult to get that number and be able to trust it in any operation. But because what you're really asking them is to just please tell us how you're violating your <laughs> authorization to do business, and that's gonna, that would be difficult to probably get. Yeah, I mean, I'm very curious. Sure I'd love to have that data, but but well, I, agree, I agree with you, Commissioner Benjamin. Although I would say that um, I think any of the the transportation engineering firms could stand outside with those little counters we oh, used sure. to have and do the ins and outs on an hourly basis, and I think it could be done. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. a study. It could be done. You yeah. Can. Right. I think if you send a letter out to the commercial garages and others and say, right. "How many extra cars do you have here?" Yeah. I'm going to tell you none. None. We're, we, we're hurting. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, Commissioner Gold. Now, I, I guess I just want to add to that, though. It can be done. I think it would be expensive to do. And also from having looked closely a number of years ago at the parking business, what you find is that during the day, during the, the commercial lots are the ones that might overflow versus the residential, right, because where they actually make their money is on the turnover. It's not – it's not on the, the one who's parking it for the month. It's the one who's coming in for an hour where they charge a lot of money and then they keep going. So there they try to stuff the garages. So there, there is a question. It is a good question about whether as Midtown is kind of is starting to change and you're seeing less, let's say, commercial use, right, and less folks in the city five days, is there less of that happening? And, and there might be. Um, but it's, it's interesting. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, with that, uh, thank you very much, Connor. Sure. This item is certified, and we will look forward to seeing it again down the line. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, let's uh, go to the next. The fourth item on our agenda is a post-referral review of a zoning authorization in Manhattan Community District 11, and our presenter is Jose Trucios. All right, this is uh, 180 East, 125th Street. I was here in um, February uh, presenting a little bit of this, kind of like the larger side and, you know, plans for this area in Upper Manhattan. Um, you can recall the, the MTA ISMAN certification. Uh, but now today we're here to talk about uh, fresh authorization for the actual proposed development on the zoning lot. This is an application about 125th is 3L, uh, the Lease LC, the, the party who will be, you know, leasing the actual proposed development site. Uh, as for the zoning authorization, pursuant to Senate Resolution 6322 to modify the maximum building height. And the action will facilitate the development of a 15-story mixed-use building containing residential commercial uses um, and generating about 500 units of housing of them up to 160 will be affordable. 
the ground floor will be occupied by about 24,000 of commercial, 24,000 square feet of commercial, and that will include the fresh food store at a 6,194 square feet. The site is located in a C4 Port D district, an RA equivalent within the special 125th district, and as well as the special transit land use district. Uh, it is bounded by Lexington Avenue to the west, Third Avenue to the east, East 125th uh, to the north, and East 124 to the south. Um, it contains lot, you know, the Sony lot is 20 and 27, but the proposed development will be only located in lot 27. Uh, a little bit of background on the timeline. Uh, the Harlan is Harlan urban renewal plan um, allowed the development to, you know, pursue with the creation of the Pockmart supermarket around in 1998. This Pockmart supermarket was vacated since 2015. Uh, the, you know, uh, the Papmar and the other building uh, that were part of the actual zoning lot have been raised and it's all clear out at the moment. Just quickly on the uh, FRESH program, the Food Retail Extension and Support Health Program was created in 2009. There were some updates in 2021 that I will mention in here. As I mentioned, the MTA, you know, the updated MTA was approved on early this month on February 13, 2023. And Manhattan Community Board uh, issued to approve the project in March 22nd of this year. There is existing conditions of the size. I mentioned there is a, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the the lot has been completely, you know, cleared out. There is no Bachmar anymore uh, in the area. You know, the corridor uh, exhibits multiple, you know, new type of development in the area. You got Cotton Plaza, one is Harlan. Uh, there are things up and coming on 125th Street. There's a system conditions in their avenue looking into the development site. A lot of, you know, saying of the more, a lot of um, residential with some high rise up to like 20 stories in the area um, and the proposed development. So as I mentioned, they're proposing 15 stories mixed use building uh, with a residential, you know, of 500 plus units and up to 30%, up to 30% of affordable housing. Uh, the transmit the transmit evening is only located in lot 20, as you can see in the figure in the drawing the, in the um, the bottom, and it will include 102 parking spaces. Right, uh, parking spaces will be accessible through East 124th Street, and the main residential area is on Third Avenue. The proposed fresh food store is located in East 125th Street in the core thereof, the proposed development. Um, just quickly to go into what a fresh food store, you know, main definition is, you know, there are particular uh, requirements or conditions that this, uh, the fresh food store needs to meet in order to be qualified as a fresh food store, which we had determined that this application does, you know, where at least 6,000 square feet is allocated to the sale of general food. Uh, there is the, different requirements between the, you know, what percentage to be allocated for non-perishable and perishable uh, food cell and all of the, you know, minimum requirements have been analyzed. And also as well, the signage and transparency requirements. Uh, and here's a quick um, kind of like look at what the fresh food store area ground floor plan would look like with, you know, <clears throat> for the sale of food and non-food products. Just the space that says non-grocery space will be allocated for a uh, checkout area. And there is also the non-retail space, which is a, an office space for the uh, ground floor of the fresh food store. All right, so in order to um, grant the authorization to modify the maximum building height, uh, so going from 15, uh, up to 15 feet and up to one story of what's currently allowed on the, what the zoning currently allows, this will allow the applicant to go from 140 feet to 160 feet, 14 stories to 15 stories. They said that the, they had to meet some findings on this uh, particular authorization. And here, here's the waiver side plan that allows the development to accommodate more than the additional residential area generated to the fresh certification. The fresh certification essentially gives you one square foot of re additional residential area 
per one square foot of uh, generated fresh food store. And if you recall, I, I mentioned it was about 6,194 square feet. So they are getting that amount of uh, residential area accommodated. It. But the waiver site plan includes the, the entirety of the 15th floor. So it's a little, uh, it's, since they're giving, they're getting one more additional mm. residential floor, they're accommodating additional uh, residential area that is not just for the fresh, but that will also generate 32 units of more housing per se. Here's a little uh, uh, clearer view of the actual waiver on the fifth and the 15th floor, the top floor. In order to meet that requirement, you also need to have a clear uh, floor to ceiling clearance of 14 feet. The applicant is proposing 14 feet and six inches to accommodate the, the fresh fruit store on the ground floor. And that is, you know, reallocated into the 15 story floor. The allowable total floor area without the astro, uh, the increase of the waiver will be 389 to 165 square feet, which will not accommodate the proposed food store area with a clearance of, you know, lower than 14 uh, 14 feet. And in order to accommodate what their actual plan of the 3,809, 3, they add in the uh, ground floor of the fresh food store, and that by kind of like pushing the envelope to 14 feet, six inches, you know, have the, the bigger uh, plan, uh, sorry, I'm blanking on my words. They will need an additional height in order to accommodate the remaining floor area that is, you know, about 20,000 more floor area allocated in here. Again, resulting in 30 <laughs> units of housing. It's a little confusing because it's, uh, you know, they are, there is no particularly a one per one as a typical bonus will will do in a you know a zoning transit bonus or in a, or a pop. Just essentially the story and the actual you know waiver to introduce into this building. Uh, you know the findings on this have very particular uh, conditions that we need to um, you know to meet. One of those is that it will not insert into the lion error of the surrounding area that is in car you know within alignment with a character here's just a quick character diagram of 125th street there are other so, um, you know developments in the area like the one is harlan that is standing at 19 stories the uh, salvation army is harlan at 12 Gotham plaza i believe at 14 and the taino tower is you know around 35 stories in the area the department believes you know 125th street can Accommodate additional, uh, you know, density in the area. It's something that we have seen throughout the corridor uh, with other developments and other resources that we had done recently. Uh, the National Black Theater, uh, you know, the Victoria, like, which are kind of within, you know, walking distance of this propo uh, proposed uh, project. Manhattan Community Board, um, you know, voted to approve the project with a territory vote in favor, no opposition to abstentions. Uh, there were no concerns in terms of any of the findings that the, 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 the application was bringing forward to them, but there were some uh, comments and concerns to, you know, that were a little bit less related to the, the project and the action itself, but they were in line with what the community keeps asking on and, and want to make sure that's happening in the upcoming projects, to, you know, to ensure that the future operator commits to consistent availability of fresh foods at an affordable price at a given context of community district. While the department cannot regulate, you know, pricing on this, uh, the uh, project includes a restricted declaration that binds the property to ensure that the fresh food store, per, uh, that the ground floor is part of the fresh food store program moving forward. It binds all, you know, future uh, owners of the, of the lot and going forward. And, and on the other two, you know, points, that's more in terms of communication and ensuring that the, the applicant and the um, community board develop a more of a relationship they are, you know, this finance and this uh, comment have been passed to the developer and then understand that currently in conversation how to make that happen or move forward. And in summary, so this is, uh, you know, we bring a lot of like housing in the area as part of the site that we have seen for many years. I mean, as I mentioned, back, uh, it has been vacant for since 2015. It has been a focus of attention for community board, the board president, the department, and a lot of other agencies in the area, uh, we're very happy to finally see moving through. 
and you know, especially generating 160 units of affordable housing. You know, aside from the authorization, which is give, giving the waiver to go to the 15 stories instead of 14, everything else is being um, done as of right. So there are no additional waivers, high setbacks, or anything related to this. Is uh, the certification of first store that is, you know, a ministerial action, and the authorization, which is a CTC um, action in here. Uh, and then just, you know, a little, like, kind of like shout out to our fresh program since 2009 and, and in 2021, which was kind of improved to include the, you know, saturation analysis to ensure that we were in over, you know, populated fresh food stores in neighborhoods like Brooklyn or in other places in, in New York, and also to expand the program to 11 additional community districts. So, you know, with interior fresh food stores that have been completed, that has allowed about 1.2 million New Yorkers to live within a half a mile of a fresh market of previously, you know, underserved or, or with fresh limited food availability for residents. You know, um, we have a lot of more of this in the pipeline, and we look to see more of this um, happening, especially in Harlem. Great. Thank you very much, Jose. Let me start with Commissioner Dweck and Commissioner Benjamin. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so. Let me just digest this. No, normally, a, a fresh authorization is, a, is by the uh, ch chair authorization, unless there's a height bump. Correct. Yes. Okay. So over here, we, we have a uh, fresh request for a 6,194-square-foot uh, fresh store, which is probably the minimum that could be designed. 6,000 is the minimum, yeah. 6,000 is the minimum, mm -hmm. and um, normally it can go up to 20,000 for the, the bonus. So I'm looking at this as more of a mechanism by the developer to get the height increased rather than actually create a uh, viable, fresh market. I mean, I'd like to see the proposal go bigger. They can go up to 20,000 square feet on the fresh proposal. I noted they had about 24,000 square feet of retail. And if the community is really going to benefit, I think a bigger market mm -hmm. would, might have a, the more, a better opportunity to provide better pricing on products, more competitive and be more viable for the long term instead of being um, kind of like a little corner store. I think it could be a much more um, vibrant supermarket. That is. Um, that's pretty much my take on it. And I'd like to know what the developer yeah. feels. And, and, and not to speak on behalf of the developer on this, I'm you know, happy to, to have them come at the next session on the, you know, before the vote. Uh, but we did have, you know, Conversations about this, and I think one of one of the biggest issues is finding an operator to rent the 20,000 square footage of a fresh fruit store. You know, it's a, it's a lot larger. For this, we we have a commitment, a letter of of intent that needs to be recorded before the fresh fruit store can be certified. So you know, finding somebody who can commit to a, a such a large scale uh, store is, is a lot more complicated, especially you know when you are still finalizing plans and, and circulation, and, and you know the the store is still being developed, so the, the building is still being developed, so it's kind of hard to find somebody that will commit to that. I will say also, you know, in terms of the community board meeting that that, were, that took place twice, on March 8th and March 22nd, you know, they, they had, there is some sense of having a little more comfort with a smaller scale uh, food operator than a large scale 20,000, you know, Whole Foods or any type of, you know, big supermarket in the area. Uh, but you know, I can like I'll ask the applicant to allow more, uh, elaborate a little more on that response. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Benjamin, followed by Commissioner Marine. Um, I have a couple of questions. I thought your presentation was great, but one of my questions has to do with the fact that I was involved with getting Pathmark on 125th Street. How big was Pathmark? Well, Bart, I have it in my notes right here. Sorry, one second. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't know. I could come back to you. With okay, a well, I think it's fair to say it was bigger than 6,000 square feet. Yes. Um, and at the time, okay. there was concern about putting the single operator supermarkets that were on 2nd Avenue out of business. And so 
we kept it to a certain size so that people could continue. Although the community wanted to see a national chain, normal supermarket in addition to the supermarkets that were there. So as I look at this proposal and I see a 6,000 square foot, I mean, right now we have a number of markets entering the New York arena, including Wegmans, which is opening their second store, including Stop and Shop, which is, has taken over some of the locations from Pathmark and is opening more, including Fairway, which is opening smaller stores all over, and it's just smaller than 40,000 square feet or 37. It just seems that the 6,000 square feet, as the commissioner said, is not an attempt to provide fresh food and choice, um, but rather an attempt to gain extra square footage. And I just don't see how this is going to serve the community. So my next question is where, if you could provide in the future a map of where the supermarkets, larger chain supermarkets are located, um, I would appreciate seeing where else people have the opportunity to shop in the way that people seem to want to shop. Um, because this seems to me to be something that would have been built in the 70s in a building, not something in a building of, what, 290,000 square feet? 412. Yeah, 6,000 square feet is like the minimum that they could possibly do. Um, and you mentioned that there was discussion of who the operator would be. So I'd be interested in who the operator is at this moment. Uh, Brooklyn Fair is the operator. What's the name? Brooklyn Fair Market. Aren't they a co-op? I believe so, yes. You know it? They're a cooperative market. Excuse me, I'm sorry, out of turn. Um, they are a cooperative market, and I know of them only because we've tried to engage them in some of our projects. And do they... Is this their normal size supermarket they deal with as a cooperative supermarket, or would they do a bigger one? When the applicant approached us early on on this, they were, you know, looking at both sides. So being able to look at to take on advantage of the entire twenty thousand in their environmental impact statement, uh, ES environmental assessment statement, uh, or the the smaller scale, depending on who they were able to attract. In the in with it for the space, and I believe you know Brooklyn Fair is a little more of like the smaller scale uh, operator. But I can have the applicant definitely respond to these questions. Thank okay, because I think the size may also be related to the fact that they're only going to have one loading dock, and so if they had a twenty thousand square foot supermarket, they would need more than one loading dock. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure what's driving the size, but I fear that it's not what the community, what's driving it is not what the community would need for a full service supermarket, but rather the developer's concerns. And that's problematic for me. Noted. Uh, I just wanted to point out what we don't have, I mean, the data for all of the supermarkets or the, uh, you know, retail uh, areas on it. There, There is the, you know, saturation analysis that we do internally, but that is only comparing uh, fresh food stores within the half a mile uh, half a mile radius. You know, in this case, there's only one additional fresh food store in the area, in the area that is located on Third Avenue, you know, about like three, four blocks south of where this, oh, I'm sorry, three, four blocks, yeah, south of where this development will be located. And that essentially, you know, it like allows the applicant or the, any other application that we're proposing a fresh to have an additional 27,000 square footage of the available fresh food area. Right. But we you can see my concern is just yes. that 6,000 square feet is not, for the third of a mile, is not a, mm -hmm. a lot of supermarket. 
for this community, which has suffered in the past from a lack of sufficient choices in their marketing. Um, and since 2015, when the Pathmark closed, has continued to suffer. I know that small little stores have opened as have stands with fruit and other things, but that's not the best we can do. And maybe we need to look at looking at all the food resources within a third of a mile, not just the fresh supermarkets to get an idea of what is really available. And with all of the people we're adding in this building, what is really available to the community as shopping resources. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Let me go to Commissioner Marine. Sure, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to echo all the statements that have been made by my colleagues, because I too opine that this is very tiny. I mean, I, I go into 6,000 square foot sea town where I live, and the aisles are cramped. You don't have a good selection, and the food's not always fresh. Um, to be honest with you. And we also have to consider the fact that, you know, you have the Carlin Cultural Center, which is right down on 2nd Avenue, which is, is not fully built out yet. It's going to get built out. And we also have to consider the Bronx, because Westerners of the Bronx would come into Pathmark, and I would specifically come into Pathmark before a Pathmark was created in the Bronx, and now it's gone. I will also echo uh, Commissioner Benjamin's thoughts on, on Wegman, ShopRite, said they're the same company. They're bringing in Wegmans to the city. They want Wegmans to be known. This is a prime location where there's subway, where there's a lot of folks. And the applicant, I also heard you said the applicant or maybe the operator was not experienced with a larger market. So maybe what they need to do is find the right operator and not try to shoehorn a smaller operator into a space that is not going to serve the community. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bozar. Um, I mean, if if Brooklyn Fair really is part of the project, I think it would be interesting to hear from them through this process because I do think there's real value to supporting a worker-owned cooperative model that might be trying to grow throughout the city, and that could be considered within the overall development as a you know a benefit or a, a good that's being provided here. If they're not able to provide. Um, or not able to operate something larger, or maybe they want to operate something larger and grow even further. We'd be, I'd be curious to hear. Um, I do think it's it's interesting if this project's able to support the growth of a, you know, worker-owned food co-op. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sorio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm just this for later, uh, but I'm wondering if uh, when we see this again, we can see a little more information on how the applicant plans to address the projected uh, sea level rise uh, potential coastal inundation here. I see it on the maps that it will be subject to according to projections. Not now, but according to projections. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, Ryan, this is. Um, let's talk about the, the, the so, yeah. procedural posture of sure. this particular so one. This is, a, this is an authorization. Um, it was uh, typically we refer these out. Uh, uh, we show them to you and then refer them out. What we did here, we're trying to pilot, is we referred it out to the community board so that you would have that in, uh, input, and then we brought it to to the commission. Um, it looks like here that we have, the, and the applicant has some work to do. Mm -hmm. There is no hearing on this, so the applicant will respond in writing and uh, with through through Jose, and we can bring it back at the next review session for discussion. Um, I do not get the sense that we're ready to vote on this, so I think we'll uh, hold off on scheduling it for a vote, and Perfect. we'll get comfortable, and then Good. we'll- Good, so we will do follow-ups based on the questions that were raised today. Uh, we will we'll do a post- uh, conversation follow up before we uh, we move to schedule anything. So thank you, Jose, for your uh, for your work on this, Ryan, for that explanation, and thanks everybody for the very very good questions. So uh, with you. that, uh, let us move on to our next item, Ryan. Yep, the fifth item on our agenda is a referral of a zoning authorization in Brooklyn Community District One. Our presenter is the new deputy director of the Brooklyn office, Karenza Wood. Hooray! Congratulations. Thank you. So good afternoon, commissioners. Um, today I'll be presenting an application for Greenpoint Landing, parcel 5C2. This is an application by Greenpoint Riverview Associates, LLC, to 
facilitate the development of five to six um, mixed-use, primarily residential buildings in approximately 2.2 acres of waterfront public access areas at the Greenpoint Landing Project site in Greenpoint, Community District 1, Brooklyn. To facilitate the development, the applicant is seeking two waterfront authorizations to modify the underlying waterfront public access area, or WPAA, regulations, as well as two chair certifications, a waterfront certification and a certification for phase development. Here's an aerial view looking north. The project area is located in northern Greenpoint along the East River waterfront. The surrounding area includes a mix of residential apartment buildings, row houses, and waterfront towers as well as warehouse buildings with commercial or industrial uses and waterfront parks and open spaces. The area to the north of the project area is the remainder of the Greenpoint Landing project and west of the site is the East River. There are concentrations of neighborhood retail uses along West Street, Franklin Street and Manhattan Avenue. There are several parks in the area, including the recently constructed Newtown Barge Park located to the north along Newtown Creek. The Greenpoint Playground is located just east of the project area. Transmitter Park is located a few blocks south, and further south is the future site of the Bushwick Inlet Park. The surrounding area is served by several transit options. The nearest subway station is the Greenpoint Avenue station at the G subway line, with entrances on Greenpoint Avenue and India Street. Bus lines in the vicinity include the B62, which runs north-south along Manhattan Avenue towards Queens and downtown Brooklyn. The B43 runs north-south along Manhattan Avenue from Greenpoint through central Brooklyn. And the B24 runs east-west along Greenpoint Avenue to Queens and Williamsburg. The East River Ferry has a stop at the India Street Pier and provides service to Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. There are also two industrial business zones in the area, the Greenpoint-Williamsburg IBZ to the south and the North Brooklyn IBZ to the east. Zooming in, now looking east to get a better sense of the project area, you can see that this is the southernmost parcel of the Greenpoint Landing site. Greenpoint Landing spans approximately half a mile of the East River um, and is roughly bounded by Newtown Creek to the north, Western Commercial Street to the east, Huron Street to the south, and the East River to the west. Further south of the Greenpoint Landing site, there are several recently approved and completed projects. A certification for the one Huron Street uh, project was granted in 2019 and is currently under construction. One Java Street was granted authorizations for modifications to waterfront regulations in 2021. And 155 West Street, a 39-story residential building and its 22,000 square foot waterfront esplanade was the first Greenpoint waterfront development constructed. In 2005, nearly 200 blocks in the Greenpoint Williamsburg neighborhoods, including the project area, were rezoned from primarily manufacturing districts and older mixed-use districts to a mix of residential and mixed-use districts as part of the city-sponsored Greenpoint-Williamsburg rezoning. The Greenpoint waterfront was mapped with a blend of R8 and R6 districts with C24 overlays along portions of West Street, permitting residential and commercial uses and facilitating the development of waterfront public access areas. Under special rules for this area established by the 2005 rezoning, the R6 and R8 districts Maps on each site blend to permit um, residential uses to an FAR of approximately 3.7, which could be increased to 4.7 under the Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program. The R6 and R8 boundaries were drawn to permit high-rise towers within the R8 districts towards the water and lower development toward the upland neighborhood. As part of the 2005 rezoning, the Greenpoint-Williamsburg Waterfront Access Plan, or WAP, was established and designated 27 individual parcels along the waterfront, each with different regulations, and which identify the location of different types of open spaces and visual corridors along the waterfront. The development site itself is uh, zoned as a mix of R6 and R8 districts with a C24 commercial overlay along a portion of the site. C24 commercial overlays permit up to 2.0 FAR for commercial uses. The upland blocks are mapped with R6B districts and M12R6A and M12R6B districts within the MX8 Special Mixed Use District. The MX districts permit uh, a mix of light manufacturing, commercial, and residential uses. These areas contain residential and mixed residential and commercial buildings that are two to six stories in height, as well as industrial and loft buildings between one and three stories in height. The areas to the south include waterfront sites in various states of development. In terms of flood risk, the project area is located in the 1% and 0.2 annual chance flood zones. C24 
Seaward portions are predominantly within the V zone or velocity zone. The proposed development site is the last parcel within the broader Greenpoint Landing Master Plan. Approved in 2013, the Greenpoint Landing application including, included a UDAP disposition of city-owned property, zoning tax amendments, waterfront certifications, and authorizations. When fully built out, Greenpoint Landing will include approximately 5,500 dwelling units, of which at least 1,400 will be income-restricted. It will also include ground floor retail space, approximately 1,800 accessory parking spaces, and will also include um, uh, four acres of publicly accessible open space. When complete, Greenpoint Landing will provide an open space network that will include a connected 40-foot shore public walkway, upland connections, and varied programming along the waterfront. There have been various, um, numerous follow-up ap ap applications to facilitate the development and waterfront access on these sites. The project uh, area here is outlined. Immediately to the north of the development site is parcel 5B15C1, which includes two residential towers and an approximately 49,500 square foot WPAA. Parcel 5E is a city-owned site in the location of Newtown Barge Park. To the northeast of the park is parcel 5A, which includes two 100% income-restricted residential buildings along Commercial Street and two residential towers on the waterfront. An additional waterfront tower and a 100% income-restricted building are currently under construction. Um, on the easternmost portion of the parcel. The entire um, approximately 55,000 square feet of WPAA in Parcel 5A has been constructed and is open to the public. Greenpoint Landing also includes a portion of the block on the east side of West Street between DuPont Street and Eagle Street, designated as Parcel 5B25D. The southwestern corner of the block is improved with a 100% income-restricted building and a 40-story mixed-use residential building is currently under construction on the northern portion of the block. The development site comprises zoning lot 5C2 on parcel 5C of the WAP and forms the southern portion of the Greenpoint Landing area. It is located between Eagle Street to the north, the midpoint of Green and Huron Streets to the south, and West Street to the east. The development site has a seaward area of approximately 319,000 square feet and an upland area of approximately 428,000 square feet and includes the site of the former Green Street Pier, an existing pier under the zoning resolution. Parcel 5C in the WAP specifies that two upland connections and visual corridors are required, one at Eagle Street and the other at Green Street. The development site is paved but otherwise unimproved and is presently being used for vehicle and equipment storage. This current use will be discontinued upon redevelopment. So here are some photos of the site. This is a view from the intersection of Eagle and West Streets, looking west down the Eagle Street Upland Connection on parcel 5B15C1. This is a view southeast from the Upland Connection, looking towards the development site. This is a view looking um, up nor north up West Street with 5B1 on the left, the development on parcel 5B2, 5D on the right, and then further north, there's a portion of the development of parcel 5A further on the right. And this is a view looking down West Street from the intersection of Eagle and West Street. And this is a view looking down, or looking east down Eagle Street with the parcel 5D development on the left. This is a view looking further south down West Street with upland buildings on the left and the development site on the right. This is a view from the intersection of Freeman and West Streets looking west at the development site. And this is a view from the intersection of Freeman and West Streets looking west, oh, sorry, at the, at the intersection of Green and West Streets looking west towards the southern edge of the development site. And this is a view from that same intersection looking further south. Um, towards the one Huron development in the background. And this is a view um, from Green Street looking northwest across the development site with parcel 5B1 in the background. And this is a photo of the development site lo looking towards the East River. And this is also on the development site looking across towards Northern Greenpoint. The applicant proposes to construct multiple as of right primarily residential buildings on the development site. In connection with the construction of the, these buildings, the applicant will provide required WPAA. As part of the WAP, locations and requirements for visual corridors, upland connections, supplemental access areas, and peer access are specified. This is an overview of the proposed site plan and WPAA layout. Key components of the waterfront proposal include a new Green Street Pier, 
a waterfront esplanade, multiple seating areas, paths to get closer to the waterfront, and a lawn. The proposed development will incorporate best practices for shoreline resiliency. The ground floors of the building will be located above the 1% annual chance flood zone um, and the flood resistant construction elevation. The waterfront upland connections and supplemental public access areas and adjoining access points will be graded to allow direct access to, um, to front doors down to the shoreline. Um, the WPAA will include the planting of native plant species, which require less maintenance. It will also include constructing a soft sloping shoreline edge made of riprap with riparian plant species interspersed between stones, which facilitate the creation and viability of microhabitats for birds and fish. Pursuant to the WPAA requirements and based on a lot area inclusive of the area of the Green Street Pier, waterfront regulations require a minimum of approximately 75,000 square feet of WPAA. In addition, waterfront area attributable attributable to parcel 5D on the east side of West Street must also be provided, um, including 4,200 square feet required to be located on the development site for a total, total waterfront access requirement of approximately 80,000 square feet. The proposed development exceeds this requirement with a WPAA of approximately 96,000 square feet consisting of several elements. A 40-foot shore public walkway would extend from Eagle Street to Green Street and have an area of approximately 28,500 square feet. Two additional supplemental public access areas would have a combined area of 11,776 square feet, one of which would be located at the intersection of the Shore Public Walkway and Freeman Street, and the other would be located at the intersection of Shore Public Walkway and Green Street, which is required by the WAP. The southern half of Eagle Street would be constructed as an upland connection, thereby completing the Eagle Street upland connection as the northern half of the upland connection is located on zoning lot um, 5B15C1. The WPAA would also include an upland connection along Green Street, providing pedestrian access to the Shore Public Walkway and Green Street Pier from West Street. The total area of the two upland connections on the development site would be 33,556 square feet, and both upland connections would be maintained as visual corridors as required by zoning. The Green Street Pier would be reconstructed, and its entire 22,000 square foot area would be used for waterfront access. Although not an upland connection, a connection would be provided at Freeman Street and sidewalk, sidewalks would be designated as public access areas. The WPAA complies with all waterfront regulations other than modified by the requested authorizations. So starting at the northern edge of the site, this is a view of the Meadow Walk, which serves as a secondary pathway through the WPAA and includes picnic areas between the Shore Public Walkway and the walkway. Further south, this is the Freeman Street connection, which mitigates the elevation of the upper portion of the site with the lower elevation of the WPAA through a series of switchbacks. A lawn would be located to the north of this path. To the south of Freeman Street, this is a typical section of the WPAA, which demonstrates the elevated shore public walkway, seating, and a buffer area between the WPAA and the residential building. At the southern end of the WPAA, there will be a large oval lawn lined with seating, uh, and seating steps will be constructed along the water's edge. A six-foot wide plant planted buffer area will separate the public walkways and seating areas from the private terraces of the adjacent buildings. And finally, this is an image of the proposed Green Street Pier, which will uh, include um, shaded areas and multiple types of seating. So in order to facilitate the proposed development, the applicant is seeking two authorizations, one to modify requirements for location, area, and minimum dimensions of WPAA and visual corridors, and another to modify design requirements for WPAA. The applicant is requesting a waterfront authorization pursuant to ZR 62822A to modify ZR section 62-30 and 62-50 to address future flooding concerns and to respond to the unique geography of the site. The requested modifications include, one, a reduction in the width of the proposed circulation path within 15 feet of a shared lot line. Uh, ZR section 62332B2I states that the level of the waterfront yard may be raised to a higher elevation provided that the level of the waterfront yard within 15 feet of the shared lot line does not exceed three feet above the level of the adjoining street, public park, or WPAA, and that the width of the circulation path at that lot line 
is greater than that required by ZR Section 6262A, which is 12 feet. The proposed development would not meet this latter requirement for a wider circulation path in order to facilitate a seamless transition to the circulation path on 5B1 to the north. And the second waiver is to the level of the visual corridor. ZR 62512 um, states that the lowest level of a visual corridor shall be determined by establishing a plane between the curb and natural shoreline or bulkhead. The proposed development would increase the grade of the visual corridor to account for building entrances elevated above the 1% annual chance floodplain. The level of the visual corridor permitted on Eagle Street um, runs from 8.7 feet at the stabilized natural shore to an elevation of 15.9 feet, five feet above the curb elevation at Eagle Street. The level of the proposed visual corridor at Eagle Street would range from 12.5 feet to a highest point of 17.5 feet. And on Green Street, the level of the visual corridor permitted um, ranges from 5.3 feet at the stabilized natural shore to an elevation of 13.35 feet, five feet above the curb elevation at Green Street. The level of the proposed visual corridor in Green Street would range from the street elevation of 8.35 feet to a high point of 18 feet. The applicant is requesting a waterfront authorization pursuant to ZR 62822B to reduce the required amount of continuous tree pits and alter wall heights. ZR 6264C requires that for type two upland connections, a continuous tree pit be provided with one tree for every 25 feet of private driveway frontage. Based on the driveway length for every 20, um, with, sorry, based on the driveway length of each upland connection, nine trees are required on the so southern side of the Eagle Street driveway, and 16 trees are required on each side of the Green Street driveway. The proposed development would provide seven trees of, um, on the south side of Eagle Street, 14 trees on the north side of Green Street, and 11 trees on the south side of Green Street. This reduction is requested due to required Con Edison util utility vaults that will occupy a portion of sidewalks, restricting the area available for tree planting. Outside of the portions of the sidewalks used by required utility vaults and building entrances, plant tree, sorry, plant tree space approximately 25 feet apart would be provided, providing a functionally equivalent design. And then two, for ZR 62651C3, it prohibits walls to exceed a height of 21 inches. The proposed development would include walls between the WPAA and the terraces of the adjacent buildings that have heights between zero and six feet. The wall height addresses grade changes between WPAA and the private buildings. This wall would provide a continuation of vegetative design of the WPAA on a cable trellis with vines and a six foot buffer of additional trees and shrubbery planted adjacent to the wall. And that is the um, end of the presentation. Happy to take questions. Great. Thank you very much, Carenza, and congratulations again to you on your new role. Well deserved. Um, let me just run through a couple of the, the details that you, that you noted. So we've got two different authorizations, one of them that uh, starts here and ends at the council, and one of them that starts and ends here at the City Planning Commission, correct? That's correct. The first one is the uh, proposed changes for the level of the waterfront yard and the elevation of the visual corridor. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Um, on the level of the waterfront yard, so as I understand this, and this is really just for clarification purposes, and I think we've got it, but... So you are able to um, elevate your lot if you're within 15 feet of a shared lot line. Um, and if you want to be able to elevate it to the grade next door, um, you, can, you can do that, provided that the width of your path is at least 12 feet. Is that right? Greater than what's required, which is 12 feet. That's okay. Correct. And here they're proposing 12, but not greater than 12. That's right. Therefore, they need an authorization that allows them to stop at 12. That's right. Okay. Um, and on the and the visual corridor, I think was uh, was clear enough. Um, on the the tree requirements, um, the changes on Eagle and Green Street, um, the the rationale for the reduction in the number of trees that are required under the existing rules and why they want the authorization for change is related to Con Edison. Can you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's right. Um, they don't have the exact location of where these utility vaults will be. 
Um, but this is based on um, other projects that they've developed in the area and anticipated location of those vaults. So this will accommodate and give the, the developer some flexibility on where those vaults can be located. Okay. Got it. And then the last one is the max wall height of 21 inches, and they, there will be a, they're proposing a range uh, here. Um, and what is, the, what, what is the purpose of a wall height that is beyond 21 inches here, and, and what is the uh, implication for this site? That's right. And so, you, as you'll see here, there's an interaction between the, w, the public WPAA and the, the private terraces. Um, in gray, these are the towers, and in light gray, um, to, the, to the westward side, those are private terraces, and so there's a wall between these two private and public spaces, right? And so there are different regulations in the WPAAs that require um, buffers, um, and, and, and then the spirit of kind of mitigating the additional height that these buildings are being built to to get out of the, the flood zone, um, inherently these terraces are taller. Um, and so the applicant is proposing various mitigations to mitigate the impact of these walls, including um, providing this trellis, a planted trellis. And in some sections, you can see the call out here. Um, the landscape will be burned up to also mitigate the overall height of the, the wall. Okay. And then the last question for me is on Freeman Street. I know that you, you had cited the upland connection on um, Eagle and Green Streets, but on Freeman, uh, it is, there's, it's not an upland, it's not officially designated as an upland connection, and yet you will be able to get to the waterfront from Freeman Street. Uh, can you just explain the distinction between the public access area as it relates to Freeman Street and what we are seeing in terms of up, official upland connections on each of the other two streets in this map? Absolutely. So the two upland connections, Eagle Street and Green Street, were designated as part of the Greenpoint Williamsburg WAP, um, which outlined where all the upland connections would be over the entire waterfront. Freeman Street was not one of them. Um, and so those are codified within the WPAA certifications um, and, and open spaces. However, as part of considering a, you know, a site plan for this large parcel, the applicant is proposing um, another connection through the site to bring people into the waterfront public access areas, and that's Freeman Street. Um, and even though it's not a required WPA, they, they don't need this additional area to meet the minimum requirements of a WPAA. In order for this to function like a public space, the applicant um, is going to ensure that the sidewalks here are essentially function like a WPAA and they'll be accessible to the public. The street bed itself will not be designated, but the sidewalks will be. And so those will be open to the public at the same hours as the WPAA. Great, terrific, thank you. Let me go to Commissioner Marine. Thank you, sir. Commissioner, thank you for the presentation. Just one quick question. I mean, it, it, it sort of kind of yells obviousness here. It was, was When the WAP was created originally, were the only two streets intended to be here Eagle and Green, and was Freeman added later, which is why it's not part of the WAP? So I don't know the exact answer as to why Freeman wasn't considered, but when considering the location of visual corridors, we have requirements around that are often 600 feet between visual corridors. So um, I can give, get back to you with a more specific answer, but my understanding is that this was um, in part to kind of reflect our standard approach to creating visual corridors and upland connections, um, and that perhaps a, a third one in the middle is not sort of our standard approach to defining to where, where these locations should be. I'm, I was just trying to figure out the thought process. Maybe uh, what I was saying, maybe the city thought of this as one block that was going to be built in its entirety, but you've given me a rationale of the 600 feet, which makes sense. Mm. But I do think the introduction of that third one in the middle does make all the sense in the world. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate the response. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Benjamin. Commissioner. Um, Question on the design. I know it's not required, but this isn't a whole lot of space being provided. And I was just wondering if there was any thought to some active recreation space. We're adding whole new populations here and in these buildings, and none of the space that is provided as part of the WAP is active recreation. I mean, I guess you could say that people can run on this space. Um, but in terms of populations of children and young adults, there's not a lot other than seating. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, when, the, when this was being developed, there was a push from the community for more naturalistic spaces um, 
if you look at some of the other waterfront spaces along the Greenpoint Williamsburg waterfront, um, you know, we have a lot of sort of hard edges that really comply with waterfront zoning. And so the intent here was to create more, again, of a natural experience, again, kind of based on feedback from the community. Um, there are certainly other parks in the neighborhood. For example, Newtown Barge Park has a baseball field. Um, and so that's, you know, nearby as part of the master plan. Um, so that's, again, this is in part in response to the kind of the goals that the community had for one of the last parts, well, really the last parcel of the Greenpoint Landing site. Okay, because particularly in looking at the oval mm -hmm. in the southern yeah. part of the site, that is going to just have benches and a lawn. It just seems that a tot lot or something for children to play would just is wanting to be put there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, this will go back to the community board for their input, so it'll be interesting to see how these conversations will evolve as part of that process. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sorio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and congratulations again. Um, I had a couple questions, uh, and, and thanks for the presentation. I thought it was really useful. I just wanted to ask, apologies if I missed it, but is there a map where we can see an overlay of the velocity zone and the WPAA? The reason why I ask is because this this strikes to me as a as a case where we shouldn't just be looking at flooding like horizontally, but actually accounting for wave action. And so I, I want to understand a little bit, sort of like given the the high vulnerability of the site to inundation, how does that relate to storm surge? And along those lines, I would like to know if if you can clarify also whether the coastline is being modified or whether it's uh, being maintained. Uh, th that'll help me understand a little bit, sort of like the tree, the discussion about the tree requirement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I don't have, unfortunately, a map right now with that overlay. If we go back to the map, um, okay, here we go. Uh, so you can see, for the most part, it looks as though there's a small portion within the V zone in the north, um, but the rest of the site is is outside of it. Though, of course, the pier would be within that zone as well. Um, and, you know, can talk to the applicant, too, about things that they're considering for the pier in regards to this issue. Um, and then in terms of the coastline, I don't believe they're modifying it, but I will confirm. Thank you. One one other quick question. I, I also wanted to know if um, th does the WRP or the WPA, in fact, um, create, uh, contain, include any provisions associated with um, evacuation purposes of, uh, in terms of, in, within the discussion of open, of waterfront access, just because this is also, I think, a zone one and two evacuation, um, the, 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 this is a zone one, two, sort of like the top evacuation uh, area by Department of Emergency Management. So I'm just wondering if that has permeated or if we can discuss that and or specifically interested if, if there are any provisions in the WRP that could help you help us with this. So I will say this is a type two action which did not require a WRP, um, but that's certainly something that we can talk to the applicant about and do some more thinking about during this referral period. Thank you, Commissioner. Let me see if there are other questions here. Okay, thank you, Carenza. We will refer this one out to the community board and. Uh, and we appreciate uh, your, the detailed uh, presentation today. Thanks again. Okay, Ryan. Okay, for future votes for consideration later today, uh, Monday, March 27, 2023, <laughs> uh, we have 2560 Boston Road rezoning, uh, just noting that staff have recommended approval of this important housing opportunity in an area of the city with good transit access and little recent uh, new housing development. Um, on, we also have 155 18th Street authorization, and Juki Sai is here to discuss. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is a private application by Guinea Pig Holdings, represented by Opera, <laughs> sorry, <yeah. laughs> by Opera Studio Architecture, for a zoning authorization pursuant to ZR 4247 to facilitate the construction of a new three family residents in an M12D district at 155 18th Street in South Park Slope, Brooklyn Community District 7. The post-referral hearing for this project was held on February 27th. 
On March 15th, Community Board 7 held an informal vote on this project, and it passed with 35 yes votes and one no vote. The proposed action will not change the existing land use on the lot, and if passed, it will result in one additional residential unit. The department supports the land use rationale of this proposed project. I'd like to share a couple responses to questions from our commissioners in the last hearing. Regarding the current tenant status, there are two apartments and each have rental tenants paying market rate rents. Their year-long leases are expired and they are on a month-to-month -month arrangement. They've agreed with the landlords to move out on April 30th. The proposed development will also, excuse me, will have two rental apartments in addition to the owner's duplex unit, if passed. And regarding the 197A plan, so a little bit of background on it, the Sunset Park 197A plan was sponsored by Brooklyn Community Board 7 and prepared in 2007. It sets forth a comprehensive framework for the revitalization of the Sunset Park waterfront as an economically viable and environmentally sustainable resource that is closely related to and serves the needs of the adjacent upland communities. Notably, the Sunset Park 197A plan does not include provisions about converting existing residential to commercial or manufacturing. And noting here that 155 18th Street is actually east of Third Avenue, uh, the 197A plan does call for comprehensive housing, excuse me, a comprehensive housing preservation program for the M1, 2D, and R districts west of Third Avenue, aimed at encouraging rehabilitation and improvement of existing housing stock. And I just included that because it makes mention of the M1, 2D districts in this neighborhood. And thank you. That's what I have on this application. Great. Thank you very much. Let me see if there are any questions for you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Ryan, what's next? Okay, um, Juki has the next one. It's uh, 88 3rd Avenue, the HRA lease extension. Welcome back, Juki. It's been a while. <laughs> Long time. Good afternoon, commissioners. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. This is an application for a 195 notice of intent to acquire office space action jointly sought by HRA and DCAS to facilitate the renewal of a lease for approximately 97,000 square feet of office space currently being used by HRA at 88 Third Avenue in Borham Hill, Community District 2, Brooklyn. The pre-hearing review session for this project took place on March 13th, and the CPC public hearing for it took place on March 15th. The department supports this application. Renewing the lease at 88 Third Avenue would ensure that HRA has a centrally located ADA accessible office space to conduct business from until their facility, excuse me, until the facility they plan to move to at 2440 Fulton Street is available for tenancy. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. Right. On to the next. Thank All you. right. Uh, Thank you, we Juki. Have, we have uh, 14105109th Avenue rezoning, um, noting that Commissioner Rampashad is recused and that staff is recommending approval for this thoughtful increase in housing capacity in this neighborhood. Okay. Great. For uh, post hearing follow ups, uh, the Cole Street development, I believe Amy Obanaga is on the Zoom for discussion. Good afternoon, Commissioners. The Department of City Planning supports the applicant's proposal for a city mapping action to facilitate development of 101 units within the Richmond Valley neighborhood of Community District 3 on Staten Island. The city mapping action would include the extension of Cole Street and the establishment of Blue Belt Loop, Cool Court, and Lookout Court, as well as the adjustments of grades necess necessitated, thereby including the authorization for any acquisition or disposition of real property related thereto in accordance with map number 32D. The application also includes CPC authorizations uh, per zoning resolution 107-64 and zoning resolution 107-65 for tree removal and topographic modification, as well as CPC certifications per 107-08 and 107-121 for future subdivision 
and public school seats, which the Department of City Planning staff also supports. Also noted that the Community Board Number 3 on January 11, 2023, unanimously approved the city mapping action. That concludes. Thank you, Amy. Okay, Ryan. Okay. Uh, we have uh, 6110 Queens Boulevard rezoning. Uh, Shristi Bajrachara Shaka is here to discuss. Good afternoon, Chair Karatnik and uh, Commissioners. The Department of City Planning staff supports the applicant's proposal to amend the zoning map from uh, AC12 commercial overlay to a C24 commercial overlay over the existing R71 and R6 zoning districts to facilitate the use of a 16,000 square feet of gym which would be located on the second floor of the existing two-story commercial building. The R24 commercial overlay would provide more flexibility in permitted uses within the project area and would be consistent with the commercial character of the surrounding area, as well as serve residents in the Big Six complex. Great. Thank you very much. All right. And uh, 2650 Brooklyn Queens Expressway West rezoning and Sarah Avila will uh, discuss. Good afternoon, Chair Garadnik and Commissioners. This is the post-hearing follow-up and staff recommendation for 2650 Brooklyn Queens Expressway rezoning. As a reminder, this project had a public hearing on Wednesday, March 15, 2023. This is a private application by 2650 BQE LOR LLC for a zoning map amendment uh, to rezone block 1019 lots one and two from an M11 zoning district to an M12 zoning district to facilitate the enlargement and an ex an expansion to an existing physical cultural establishment in the Woodside neighborhood of Queens, Community District 1. The proposed development will be a three-story building with a mezzanine, approximately 56,652 square feet, and have an FAR 1.31. The max under the M12 uh, proposed zoning district is uh, 2.0. The development, uh, the department recommends approval of the application as it is, would allow for a moderately higher density non-residential development in a primar primarily commercial and industrial area the current M11 zoning precludes a future expansion due to its allowable floor area. The proposed M12 zoning district will enhance and reinforce the industrial and commercial character of the area. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, that's the end of our review session. Um, Great. Want me to open the... Uh... Let's do it. So yeah. we, will, uh, we will close the, uh, the review session and we will open our special public meeting yeah. of today... Monday, March 27, 2023. Ryan, do you right. want to do the honors? Yes. Good afternoon. This is the City Planning Commission special public meeting held remotely through the NYC Engage portal and in person at the City Planning Commission hearing room, 1 County Broadway, Lower Manhattan. Today is Monday, March 27, 2023. I will now call the roll. Chair Garodnik. Here. Vice Chair Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Benjamin. Present. Commissioner Bozard. Here. Commissioner Cirillo. Here. Commissioner Crowell? Here. Commissioner Duick? Here. Commissioner Gold? Here. Commissioner Goodridge? Here. Commissioner Kamani? Here. Commissioner Marin? Here. Commissioner Osorio? Here. Commissioner Rampashad? Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the public meeting of Wednesday, March 15, 2023. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, on the minutes, I make a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 15th. Is there a second? second, second. Commissioner yes. Rampershad, second. All those in favor, please uh, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Minutes are approved. Okay. Scheduling. Uh, calendar number one is laid over. On calendar number two, we have a resolution for adoption scheduling Wednesday, April 12th, 2023, for a public hearing to be held to the NYC Engage portal. Great. Thank you. April 12th. Can you believe it? April. There it is. <laughs> On the resolutions, I make a motion to approve. Uh, is there a second? Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Marine. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Resolutions adopted. All right. The next item is the report section on page four. Borough of the Bronx, calendar numbers three and four. Uh, CD 11, calendar number three. C220283 ZMX, calendar number 4, N220284 ZRX, in the matter of an application for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 2560 Boston Road rezoning. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 3 and 4, Chair Garodnik. Aye. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. 
Commissioner Benjamin? Aye. Commissioner Bozorg? Yes. Commissioner Cirillo? Yes. Commissioner Crowell? Yes. Commissioner Duick? Yes. Commissioner Gold? Yes. Commissioner Goodridge? Yes. Commissioner Kamani? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Osorio? Yes. Commissioner Rompershaw? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on counter numbers three and four. Borough of Brooklyn, counter number five, uh, CD7, N230088, ZAK, in the matter of an application for the grant of an authorization concerning 155 18th Street for the adoption of counter number five. Chair Grodnick? Aye. Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Benjamin? Aye. Commissioner Bozorg? Yes. Commissioner Cirillo? Yes. Commissioner Crowell? Yes. Commissioner Duick? Yes. Commissioner Gold? Yes. Commissioner Goodridge? Yes. Commissioner Kamani? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Osorio? No. Uh, I, the reason why I vote no is because the purpose of the M12D is to maintain residential uses in industrial areas. I think that expanding residential uses, we are increasing the FAR through new buildings, which is another important uh, component here, actually changes the context of industrial areas, which is a central part of the criteria for evaluation. So increasing residential here would set a precedent in a community that has set green industrial development as a paramount priority. Although this is a small proposal, it is difficult to authorize it without additional information, like for example, how many authorizations for new residential buildings have taken place in M12D districts? How will the process address direct displacement of the current residents? I know that we're talking about two families, but these are two families that are gonna have to move once the building is demolished. And also, as I've mentioned before, this is listed as Greenwood, Greenwood Heights in page, on page number four of the briefing package but this keeps being presented to us as South Park Slope. So what is gonna to happen to the residents once the new building reflects uh, Park Slope rent prices? Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Calendar number five has been adopted. <clears throat> Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number, uh, calendar number six, uh, CD2N230107PXK in the matter of an application for a notice of intent to acquire office space concerning 88 3rd Avenue Human Resources Administration lease extension. For favorable reports on calendar number six, Chair Garodnik. Aye. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Benjamin. Aye. Commissioner Bozorg. Yes. Commissioner Cirillo. Yes. Commissioner Crowell. Commissioner Duick? Yes. Commissioner Gold? Yes. Commissioner Goodridge? Yes. Commissioner Kermani? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Osorio? Yes. Commissioner Rampashaw? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number six. Borough of Queens, calendar numbers seven and eight, CD 12, calendar number seven, C220267, ZMQ, Calendar number 8N220268ZRQ in the matter of an application for a zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 14105109th Avenue rezoning. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 7 and 8, Chair Grodnick? Aye. Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Benjamin? Aye. Commissioner Bozorg? Yes. Commissioner Cirillo? Yes. Commissioner Crowell? Yes. Commissioner Duick? Yes. Commissioner Gold? Yes. Commissioner Goodridge? Yes. Commissioner Kamani? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Osorio? Yes. Commissioner Rampashad? Recuse. Uh, favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers seven and eight. Great. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, is there any other business before the commission today? No, Chair Grodnick. Okay. Well, with that, this special public meeting is adjourned. The time is now 328. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. We are adjourned.